Good afternoon. I'm Shelley Jones, Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement at Missouri State University. The Alumni Association is the organization through which Missouri State students continue their connection with MSU when they leave the university. The Alumni Association is a non-dues paying organization, so all of our alums are viewed as members. If you are new to our series, Bear Talks webinars are monthly professional development sessions now available in a virtual format. So how today's webinar will work. We can't see or hear you. We'll have you use the Q&A feature for questions. And then this month for increased engagement, we are also opening up the chat feature, which will be monitored on the back end by my colleague, Candace Wolf. Throughout today's session, we'll throw out a few virtual event related topics and we hope that you will share some great ideas from events that you've organized and or attended. When sharing these events for all, please make sure to use the drop down menu and select panelists and attendees. Today's session is being recorded and all registrants will receive a follow up email later this week with the link. And unfortunately, due to time limitations, most likely we will not get to every question. So we're going to go ahead and have all of our panelists turn their videos on. Um, today's topic is event planning in a virtual world. Transitioning from in-person to virtual or hybrid events or meetings can be tricky. How do you inspire engagement? Why is evaluating top priorities and obtaining feedback so important? What about technology? When is it time to just call in the professionals? Well, these are just a few of the areas that we'll be discussing with our panel. Today, we have three terrific MSU alums with us, Jared Alexander, Mary Ellen Phelan, and Aaron Mewes. So how we would like to format our session today is to visit with each of the panelists individually before moving into our more general session with all of them together during our Q&A. So let's go ahead and start with Jared. We'll have our other two, there we go. We'll have them turn their videos off. Okay, so Jared graduated in 2011 from Missouri State with a degree in Recreation, Sport and Park Administration. He has spent many years working in the nonprofit sector with both the Boy Scouts of America and now as Director of Development for Harmony House. Harmony House serves as Springfield and Greene County's only domestic violence shelter for men, women and children and it is the largest shelter in the state of Missouri. As with any nonprofit, Jared wears many hats to include that of event planner for two of the agency's major fundraisers, the Purple Party and iCare. Thank you for being here with us today, Jared. Thanks, Shelley. So let's go ahead and start with the Purple Party. Can you tell us a little bit more about that annual event and what it entails? Yeah, so the Purple Party is uh, our signature event, um, but it's not like other ones in town that we're not a uh, suit and tie gala. It's a party and it's a nice night out with friends. Uh, it's been an 80s theme uh, evening for the last several years with uh, local favorite members only, the 80s cover band and lots of food and drinks and games going on. Um, and so that's, that is the, the kind of the essence of the party is it's, it's a good time with your friends to raise awareness about uh, Harmony House, the services and resources we offer uh, and raise funds to, to keep our mission going. Great. So what time of year does that event take place? Typically it happens in April. Um, and so we just came off of our, our second uh, purple party um, in, in virtual world now. But um, so last year it would have happened uh, about the third week of April. So the third week of April typically and the pandemic kind of hit about a month prior, right? Yeah, we, we had about a month uh, notice of what we were going to do. We actually had just opened up ticket sales uh, for the event, tables and tickets, um, about four or five days before um, that, that day in March uh, that we all remember so well. Oh no, so what did you decide to do? I mean, did you move forward? Did you, yeah. We, yeah, the first thing we did was we, we talked with our board and our, our staff here and, and we really put our heads together. What could we do? Um, we looked ahead to the venue space 
Um, luckily, they had uh, a date available in August. Um, so we went ahead and said, well, let's just postpone and, and keep moving forward. And, you know, at, at the time, I think we all thought uh, and hoped that by August of 2020, that we would be in a much better spot than have this under control and, and be able to, to have the event. All right, so what does success look like for an in-person Purple Party? And then did success look different when you went to more of this hybrid mode? Yeah, so we, we went ahead and postponed it to August. Uh, typically, we would have about 500. We'd sell out at 500 people uh, in the space and enjoying the party and, and all the, the things that come along with that. Uh, when we early on realized in the summer that that was not going to happen. Um, we said, well, how can we still make this impactful? Um, and one of the very first things that we said was, we can't postpone this again. We can't cancel it. It was too important to uh, the mission uh, to be able to keep the message out there, um, not just to hold an event, but you know, to, to raise uh, some money, uh, but to raise awareness and keep uh, our message in front of people, which, which was very important to us. So we held firm on, we were gonna do this. Uh, we were gonna figure out how um, this happens. Um, and we took everything that we would see at you know, a table at the Purple Party and said, how do we still engage people with this? Um, packed it all up in a uh, Purple House Party pack, encouraged people to host a small group at their home. Uh, and we broadcast the event live. We actually kind of ended up with about an hour and a half of, of live television uh, instead of uh, a room full of 500 people, still had the band, still had uh, the auction, still had ways for people to contribute uh, to the event and still ways for people to engage with their friends and, and talk about the issues that, that we were um, bringing about with uh, our mission. So let's, let's talk about engagement. So what did you use? I think when we had talked before you said you were in this big space with a few people and a band and and you had to engage these people who were out there, not only the ones who were in your little space, but also out there. What did what did you do? Right. So, uh, like I said, we took, you know, all the things that you would have seen on your table. Um, we created that, that purple house party pack and, and sold that as uh, as you would buy a table. So everything was, you know, we had them delivered to your home uh, and we gave you a code to log in. Uh, and see a, a private broadcast of the Purple Party for your house. You could also buy just a single ticket to view that. Um, so you still got to watch the band and listen to your favorite music. You still got to uh, see a lot of the games that we were playing. We had uh, a great activity from, uh, from one of our sponsors for the event that they brought uh, an interactive game for some of our volunteers and our um, uh, folks that were out there raising money for us. Uh, they were able to engage with that and we drew names. Uh, for people to be able to win those prizes. So we still had some engagement on that level um, and, and, and seeing that people that were sitting at home watching, we were, we were still acknowledging that uh, they were making this uh, a special night for Harmony House. Great, now had, had your staff, because I, I suspect you have a pretty small staff that does the event side, like with most nonprofits. So had you all had a lot of experience with doing virtual events or was this kind of like learning by fire this this was figure it out as we go for sure um and one of the one of the early decisions we made was we, we kind of had the format in mind of how we wanted to make it happen um we we did go out and, and get some help uh and we hired a local company that does they they broadcast events and conferences all over the country and they're they're based here in springfield so uh we had a good connection with them and we reached out and said um, we, we don't want this to be, uh, you know, Jared and Millie running around the, the uh, ballroom with their iPhones and trying to, <laughs> trying to make this look legit. So we, we wanted it to be professional um, and be a good experience. So that was one of the first things we did. Um, and, and that helped us kind of make more of those decisions moving through the planning stages of how to make this virtual because they had been through this. They, you know, maybe not in this space, you know, de dealing with pandemic conditions, but they had been doing this, this is their business. And so we, we kind of leaned on them for their expertise and said, okay, now how do we make this fit our mold of a, a nonprofit uh, event and, and a fundraising event for the community? And that, and that partnership was really key, wasn't it? I mean, do you think without them, you could have had any shot of pulling this off? 
I, I think we would have made it work. It would not have looked the way it did. Uh, it was very professional. Um, I mean, we had, you know, essentially a, a TV crew there with us. Um, and all we had to do was show up and kind of bring a script of here's how we want things to play out. Um, and, and they took care of the rest. They took care of making sure that everybody had the, the login information, that it was uploaded, uh, you know, in a timely manner after the event that we had, uh, you know, recorded copies available that, you know, all the technical aspects that we would have been stressed out and pulling our hair out about the entire night, uh, we weren't because we had their help. And, and that let us focus our efforts, our staff, our volunteers on what is the event, um, what are the things that we want people to engage with that are viewing this at home uh, or bidding on our online auction ahead of time or, and through the event? What are the things that are important to us that people get from the Purple Party uh, without us stressing about, you know, is it working? Is the, is the camera on? Those type of things. Mm -hmm. And so if, if we have some listeners out there who are looking to hire out for some of the tech side, I mean, would you have some advice for them on, you know, like make sure that you find a tech group that's willing to sit side by side with you and really understand um, what, what tips would you maybe have for them? Absolutely. You, you want to be able to sit with them with, you know, your script in mind and the goals that you've set forth on these events and say, you know, these are the things that are important to us. How can we make that happen? And, and what, what do you need from us to, to get to that end goal? Um, and, and somebody that's, that's willing to do that is going to be vital to the success of your event even happening in the first place. Um, and, and so that would be number one tip, as it, I would say, is uh, if you're looking for something more than just a little bit, of, you know, a Zoom meeting um, or something like that, I would go find some local uh, professional help on, on the technical side of things for sure. Okay. And then, like we mentioned a little bit earlier, that you you did Purple Party now twice in Correct. a virtual type of hybrid type of mode. So, so tell us a little bit about how year two went versus year one. What did you do different? What did you learn? Do you a ever lot of things. Again? Well, one thing we did first was we wanted to get back on our normal time frame. Uh, so we, we did get back into April. Um, we, we knew that that was going to be important for the future of the event to get back on that uh, time schedule for folks that it's in their calendar that have been, you know, diehard Purple Party attendees. Um, we want that, we wanted that date back. So we were able to get back into April. Um, we, a lot of it, honestly, was, was a lot of kind of rinse and repeat on how are we going to do this, the formatting, you know, the, the theme kind of changed a little bit, uh, the guests changed. Um, we did add a new element of uh, a trivia, uh, so we were able to find an online resource for those viewing at home. You could play a trivia game alongside us live during the event, um, so that was really neat uh, to have a little bit more of a live engagement with our participants and our donors, um, but a lot of it really was um, we saw success in that format last year in August. Um, we knew it worked. We made a couple of tweaks to it uh, just logistically with, within our, our conversations uh, in the office, but um, a lot of it by and large was the, the same kind of format. Um, participation was, was a little bit down from prior year, but I think uh, a lot of that played into uh, the Zoom fatigue that, that we're all feeling, uh, I know, now a year plus into this thing. Um, but we, we, did, uh, we did raise some money for the, for the mission. Uh, we still achieved our goal of having our, um, we have our Harmony Heroes, six local individuals that go out and raise money on behalf of the event and compete. Um, they exceeded their goal. Um, we had a lot of great engagement with our auction so we still achieved those goals, but um, we did see a little bit of a decline, you know, year year after year or year over year uh, in the total number of, of folks that that uh, were were a part of it. But um, still a success. We still had some great viewership on there, um, and uh, and it still looked great. Great. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about iCare. I know that was another event that that you had to kind of reimagine as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what you did there? So I care is our campaign in October, National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, where we engage the business community of Springfield uh, to help us raise awareness about the issue and put resources all over town, anywhere we can, as many businesses that are willing to put uh, even just a flyer with our, our emergency hotline number up. That's our main goal. 
Um, and we typically do a, a large kickoff breakfast uh, in the end of September to get that going. Uh, that had to shift virtually. So what we did was uh, similar to the Purple Party where we had a, 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 you know, a box of resources for these businesses. They were able to just drive through the parking lot of the space. We gave them those kits got them all the information they needed, or we signed up new businesses that morning that were interested. Uh, and then at noon that day, and then played it over each lunch hour that week, um, we had a virtual orientation. So you could uh, take it back to your office, um, tune in, listen to what we had to say about how the campaign works, how you can stay engaged, uh, even digitally this year. Um, and so it, it still was a, a great success for us. And that way, we, we actually ended up uh, recruiting some new businesses that morning that uh, had heard about it. They drove through and picked up a purple eye care box on their way to work that day. Well, wonderful. Well, Jared, thanks for taking a little bit of time and we'll come back to you because we want you as part of the big group session for the Q&A. And awesome. let's go ahead and bring on Mary Ellen Keelan. And all right, so Mary Ellen graduated from Missouri State in 1993 with a degree in business and an emphasis in marketing and advertising. She has more than 30 years of experience in marketing, advertising, public relations, media management, event management, and sales. So she does a lot. Uh, when shelter in place orders took effect in March 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Springfield Business Journal's 30 live events had to be quickly reimagined and she was charged and was successful in ensuring that hundreds of award recipients were appropriately honored, that attendees were engaged, that nearly 100 sponsors received appropriate value for their investments and that each of these events remain profitable. So thank you for joining us today, Mary Ellen. So first off 30 events, oh my gosh. <laughs> It makes my heart just beat a little bit more here. So tell us a little bit more about the types of events that the Springfield Business Journal does. Yeah, we have a, a wide variety of events. We have events that you mentioned that are uh, company awards, individual awards. Uh, so those can be anywhere from uh, 10 honorees to 40 honorees and uh, making sure they feel special is uh, really, really important to us in those events. Then we also have content driven events. So those are where we're basically taking what people know us for, which is news content or a, a learning exchange of some sort and bringing it to a live event. And, and those tend to have more interaction. Uh, like one of them is a series of town hall events based off of uh, a community wide survey we do. And then the third type is live interview series. So this is typically uh, one of our editors sitting down with somebody or a group of people and conducting a, a live interview. And so our events have attendance from anywhere from, or our live events have attendance typically from 100 to 500 people. Wow, and, and who are your constituents? Yeah, and we've got a lot of people that we try to make as happy as possible through these. And of course, we have our honorees and then our audience, our sponsors, and uh, the, the, the one that has no face is our bottom line. Uh, so th those are our four, four constituents that we had to keep in mind as we were transferring from live events to virtual events because all of the experiences were going to change. And what objectives, I mean, with, with so many different events, what are some of the objectives that you had to consider for some of these? Well, for our live events, we're able to maximize a lot of our objectives. Uh, so we're always looking at appropriate reach and that's not necessarily uh, larger numbers. That's the right people at the right time in the right room. Uh, ticket sales, uh, interaction, uh, production value uh, in, the pre, uh, the pre, sorry, pandemic world, we were looking at live versus pre-recorded podcasts, looking at live or hybrid events or completely virtual. So looking at all those objectives and we realized in a virtual world, we just had to prioritize. We could not serve all of our masters. And, and what did you find to be your top priorities? 
that shifted with with each event uh, because there were, um, for instance, we have one of our live interview series events. Uh, it, we do sell tickets, but the tickets primarily went for the, the food costs, the actual cost of the venue. And so that was a break even for us more or less. So we said, okay, sacrifice the ticket sales and we maximize the value for our sponsor. So we uh, then looked at that priority. And of course the uh, audience was always in the forefront. That was a given. We had to give the audience a good experience or else none of the others were served at all. Uh, but then we had others where ticket sales were still very important to us. They had, because they covered uh, miscellaneous expenses of say awards events. So that directly affected our bottom line. So then in those events, we had to find new and creative ways to give our sponsors uh, value. Well, actually, since you brought that up, let's talk about some of those creative ways. I mean, I'm sure that with all those events and here's your package that you get as a sponsor, you really had to also reimagine some of the benefits that you offered. What did that look like for you all? Boy, we, re, we really did just reimagine everything. I would say what we did was say whatever rules we thought applied before, forget all of them. We're writing all new rules. And that included with our sponsors, we didn't go to them with proposals. We went to them and said, what do you value most and how can we maximize that? We were very, very fortunate that 100% of our sponsors stayed with us. They understood this was not a choice that we were making. It was, it was, a, it was a choice made for all of us. Um, uh, by a tiny, tiny little virus that we just had to take precautions against. And so everybody was really great in working with us to find ways to maximize what they appreciated most. And that was different for every single of our presenting sponsors. Uh, one actually held a pre-event and it was so elaborate that the production company thought that was our event. <laughs> it was like, oh no, we had a whole nother full-blown virtual event following that. And so that event was a pre-event because they said face-to-face -face with the honorees is important to us. So we scheduled an afternoon and we have had 10 honorees every 30 minutes comes in a parking lot. And there was, so that was when they got their uh, award presentation, their plaques, all of that, the gift package from the presenting sponsor. So that gave them, if not a handshake face-to-face, -face, a socially distanced face-to-face. -face. And uh, so in that, that made, I think, those 40 under 40 honorees feel special that, you know, there were two events to honor them this year. Oh, that's great. Um, and what strategies have you incorporated to help keep your audiences engaged? That varies, again, by event, because each event has a different personality, and we knew that we weren't going to be able to replicate the full personality of a live event. Uh, but one thing, I, I just mentioned 40 under 40. One thing we did with 40 under 40 is we said, let's bring these people into the event, usually in a live event. They're announced. Uh, a brief bio was written uh, or read out loud. They walk up, they have their picture taken, everybody sees them. But in the virtual world, we ask them to submit 30-second uh, videos. And I think we'll keep that as we go to live because we realize, wow, you really get to understand the personality of these individuals. Even though we're a relatively small business community, you may, you may recognize every face and every name, but you don't know everybody that's being honored. So, and we basically, the parameters we gave them was a video uh, that's 30 seconds long. You can do whatever you want, no copyrighted music. That was our parameter. And uh, so I think that will stay. Um, and that just, people come to our events for the people. That's overwhelmingly why people want to be there. So that allowed them to get that excitement about seeing the people they were there to visit. We kept our chat windows open at all times. So, and they, they were pretty active. We did experiment with um, post event party rooms uh, and pre event party rooms. Uh, for our audience, those were not successful. They didn't want to do that, but we do know that, and that was very, very early on while we were still under shelter and order, uh, shelter in place orders. Um, 
people were gathering in their own bubbles. So companies were gathering together, families were gathering together. So it was still a social gathering. It just wasn't a social gather gathering with 500 people. It was, we were all together alone is what we were doing. So attendees, here is your opportunity. I know there's probably several out there who are who are watching today that have either produced events, attended events, coordinated events. So what are some of the engagement ideas that you've tried or you've seen that you have felt were effective? So put those up in the chat and let's share a little bit. So Mary Ellen, tell us a little bit about what your biggest challenges were with your events and then how did you overcome them? Well, and, and part of it, we, our biggest challenge last year that finally we learned our lesson as we hit 2021, but last year we kept telling ourselves the next event and we were putting off planning and saying, okay, we're going to wait and see what's happening. What benchmark are we at? And uh, it finally dawned on us. This isn't going away anytime soon. And so this year we have just settled on, we know what our plan is going to be. Uh, last year, we started having live events in July. I think we had the first live event. We were working constantly uh, in communication with the health department and the health department uh, actually was in attendance at every single, as a, as a ticket, uh, ticketed guest at each of our events. They observed and they said, you're doing everything right. Does that mean they look like they did before? Absolutely not. Uh, but for our economic impact awards, for instance, uh, we give a lifetime achievement in business award. We said, we're not gonna steal that experience of a bigger stage from that individual. So we had a very intimate, they were able to invite, um, I believe 20 people to come to the event. We still rented out a, a big uh, room, a conference room in a hotel. It was very much like we would have um, in a larger event, but we just had six tables of people and we had a full-blown stage, but then we also brought people in through Zoom, and we were also, so there was a lot of technical difficulties having a hybrid event, giving your live audience the digital or the uh, virtual experience and giving your virtual guests the, the live experience, uh, but I think we pulled it off fairly well and made that lifetime achievement in business honoree feel a, a little bit more special than if he were just sitting in his own dining room. Great. Well, thank you for sharing with us, Mary Ellen. And so we are going to have our third panelist join us. If we can have Aaron Mukes, come on. Hi, Aaron. Hello. We're so glad to have you all the way from St. Louis. Yay. So we, we appreciate you taking some time. We know you're juggling a lot of events up there. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit about Aaron first. Uh, she graduated from Missouri State in 2002 with a degree in computer information systems. With 10 years of corporate experience in IT, problem solving and implementing projects, Erin has been able to parlay her extensive knowledge in the areas of planning and execution into creating memorable weddings and events. She's president and CEO of Divine Events LLC, a full service event planning, design and coordination company, again, located in St. Louis, Missouri. So we are just thrilled to have you. Well, so what types of events were you coordinating prior to the start of the pandemic? And then what does your world look like now in the way of events? Yes, that's a great question. So prior to, we uh, handled weddings, of course, um, fundraising galas, golf tournaments, um, birthday parties, social events, those types of events. Now, we still handle those same events. However, we do them in a different way. Uh, but now we also have added webinars, virtual trivia nights, um, virtual birthday parties, uh, just virtual anything at this point. What, is, what has been uh, one of your most fun ones that you've had an opportunity to do that you've switched from live to virtual? Ooh, oh, okay. So we did some client appreciation uh, nights before we went virtual. And now we had the most fun with a... Um, horse racing, a client appreciation horse racing virtual event. Uh, you would think that, you know, you have to be in person. No, no, we found a company that could we could partner with and we gave that experience to our client who wanted to do client appreciations for their client. So it was great. 
Horse oh, racing, I'm sorry. Horse racing. We also did derby style. So we all had on hats. Uh, it was just like, we just made it fun. You just dolled it up and we had a theme party, huh? Right. <laughs> That's great. So, you know, when the pandemic first started, so many of us really were just trying to figure things out as we went along. And I've heard uh, one of the, the best quotes I've heard is, we're building the plane as we fly it. And when I think about that quote, I think about your background in IT and oh my, how, how extremely advantageous that must have been because you weren't building your plane. You already had your plane and you were ready to fly. So how has your IT background really helped you with this conversion? Well, I will say this. First of all, kudos to Missouri State for teaching me IT because uh, it helped out a lot. Um, what it did, it helped me um, focus in on the priorities, right? So at the end of the day, you want to have a great event. Uh, you want to accomplish everything you were planning on accomplishing initially, but now we're going to, and I'm not going to use the word pivot, we're going to reimagine, right, our events in a different way. And so with it, with having the virtual background or with the computer background, it only took making sure I had the right resources to pull off what we needed to do. And one of the things that with the computer information systems background is we test, test, test. So we had a lot of test parties. It worked out perfectly. <laughs> well, um, let's see. So what did you, do you see as the biggest advantages and challenges when it comes to virtual and or hybrid events? Biggest challenges is communication with the guests for their experience. You know, you know what you're going to experience or what you're going to receive when you're in person for the most part. And now you're learning what you're going to receive with it virtual. So going forward, you know, what is it going to be? What is it going to look like for a hybrid event? And who has these different type of experiences? That's going to be the next challenge. And um, we're already ready with the communication and with um, ideas to get people geared up and ready to go. And with, with the variety of virtual events that you're using, what types of platforms are you incorporating? Um, so we definitely use Zoom. I know everybody says Zoom fatigue, but Zoom is the most cost effective right now for a lot of the clients. Um, but if you, there are other platforms that we can explore and we can use, it just depends on how you want to do it. So with Zoom, we say, we try to do interaction using Zoom. So everybody, you know, who can say, in chat hey Aaron um do that for me real quick just show me just say hey Aaron and spell my name right too a-a-r-e-n somebody do it um but the interaction we use zoom um but if you want to do broadcasting just straight out to everyone where you're not really doing as much um uh, interaction between people who are talking who are there hey Melissa thank you um then you won't see how I'm able to talk to them um you won't be able to really have that uh, interaction so when we start doing things out on Vimeo and on um, YouTube, you don't really have as much interaction. So broadcasting versus Zoom interfaces are great, are the two different options. So you really have to start with what your what are your goals and objectives of that particular event before yep. you kind of really look to see which platform is going to work the best, right? Right, we always start with goals and objectives. What is the client goals and objectives? What is your goals and objectives and then we go from there so each one so we try to do limit to three you know some people uh one day someone sat down and said i have 10 goals and objectives i said no you need to have three so it's very important those top three is the one we're going to go for there you go there you go so here's another opportunity for our attendees so we're talking about platforms here there's a lot of different meeting and event option ones out there um so attendees what platforms are you utilizing or finding to be the most successful for your virtual events or hybrid events. And just go ahead and throw your ideas there in the chat and share with us. Um, so so Shelly, real oh, quick, sorry. there's one called Bizbo. I really like that one that's coming what up. What is right it called? Bizbo. Bizbo? Yeah, biz, it's Bizabo, Bizabo, B-I-Z-Z-A-B-O. It's and expensive, but um, it's a really a platform for like conferences and speakers. It's, I mean, you can make it do whatever you want it to do, but that's one of the ones that we're um, considering using soon. You are on mute. There we go. Let's fix that. Thank you. So cost-wise, um, 
a lot of times, you know, when you think of virtual events, you think, oh, well, that's that's so much less expensive. And for some people, it may be like for a conference. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, costs? OK, so um, for a virtual event, I just think about my event planning costs and then some technology costs initially. Um, so virtual events are not less expensive. They, they can actually become more expensive. Um, and that is because you you have to for us we have we have to have a rehearsal okay so we're already we're ch we have to charge or you have to prepare for a rehearsal or run through of your event prior to your event because you want to make sure you have all the technology in place so when we hire out our um, our staff or if it's if we have our AV company come out they have to price accordingly or price for set up. For typically, we try to do the week before at the exact same time as the event. Um, that's going to be the week after the, the you know the, the next week. So, and then we try to run the entire event at the exact same time so we can get all of our timings in. And if there's any issues, we we address those during the week of the event. So, luckily, we get to do that with a virtual event because when you're in person, you don't get that opportunity <laughs> to like perfect uh, the event to make it better. So that right there in itself increases the cost. The other thing is, you know, some people, we talked earlier, some people will say, oh, well, my videographer can handle that. Well, no, you have to have a full AV company to pull off some of these events because you, you don't want your videographer to not know how to um, handle some of the connections or not be able to have the music come on properly, those types of things. So, you know, it's just investing in that part all helps the experience of your guests. Gotcha, gotcha. But I think in some cases, it's probably less costly for maybe an attendee, if it was maybe a conference and then you don't have to fly across the country and pay for hotels. But as far as the producing and the production side and the planners, yeah. uh, you're gonna be picking up a lot more uh, cost than you would in an in-person type of yeah. yeah, but you know, like you mentioned, the conferences to attend, oh man, that should be a lot less. Well, it depends on what you're gonna have because there's the base price, right? But if, if it's a really good conference, they're gonna have add-ons for you. They're gonna be able to, so you can get more of an experience at home or at your workplace. So let's talk about keeping the energy alive. I know that is like your go-to thing is we have to keep our audiences engaged and so what are some tips or tricks that, that you've incorporated or that you can offer to our, to our viewers um, that they might want to incorporate? Now, this can be for a conference, it could be for a large gala, or even just a Zoom staff meeting, those staff meetings that we all love. How do we increase some engagement there too? So, so I'm, I'm going to skip the staff meeting for a second, but I'm going to go to the events and um, the conferences. And when you're planning it, I, I feel like you need to plan like you did today, um, comments on purpose and having people engage in the chats or have polls, whatever it is to keep their engagement. Like me, I certain events, I love to have music to just throw everybody off, right? So like if um, we were, for one of our board meetings, Shelly, I don't know if you remember this, but the board meeting we had for Missouri Association um, for the Alumni Association, we were going to have music playing, but we kind of went a little long and so we couldn't get that music playing. But that would have thrown off the entire meeting in a good way because we were going to throw the fight song out there. And like, who doesn't, from alumni perspective, remember our fight song and get excited still to this day about, yes, go Bears, VE. So, you know, get people excited. Uh, depending on your audience, you need to do the research to figure out what is going to get them excited. What's going to get keep them engaged? It's all about pre-planning and, and the research aspect. And that's right. for anything. So whether it's whether it's a staff meeting, pre-plan. What 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 experience do you want to get out of it? So it's I'm always about the guest experience. So what do you want them to receive? And then you go and plan accordingly. And I think you were talking about uh, when we were chatting before about even your staff meetings. Um, and some of the engagement things you've done with Zoom and to make sure people are engaged. What were some of those? I think a camera, like a spotlight or yes, something. So we will spotlight individuals. So if I ask a question and 
and, and someone's not paying attention, I'll spotlight them and the whole screen changes. And so there is them and they're like, oh, wait, that's just me. And so I'm like, yes, do you remember the question? And so, you know, just being able to spotlight, changing the different um, views for everyone is very important to keep their, their, keep them engaged, keep them paying attention to what's on their screen. Okay. So let's talk uh, surveys and feedback. How important are they with events? They're huge. Um, surveys help you shape and mold your events and the feedback does as well. So if you start receiving feedback that things didn't work, those are the things you probably should not do anymore. Um, but it's, it's very important because the guests that are attending the event, they feel like they're valued. Um, sometimes you don't get as many back as you would like. And so I think everyone knows that there are only a few people that are going to respond, the people who really liked it or really did not. So uh, you take that information and you shape your next event and you don't take it personally. Uh, then we had one question that had come in that was pre-submitted. What suggestions do you have for encouraging networking in a virtual conference setting? So, okay, this is great. So virtual conference setting. So it's very important that, you know, you are prepared. So I always have like a notes up on my, on my computer. So if I'm on a Zoom call, I have my notes section up and I'm constantly typing. But at the very top, I always have my name, my contact information ready to go. And so I will, if we're chatting or if I meet someone, I'm like, oh, Jared, I really liked you. And I really thought that this was really cool. I might send them a side message on chat with my contact information, let's schedule something. Um, and then a couple of other things, you know, say for instance, um, you know, you do get that contact information, follow up and remember some key points in your conversation, just like you would do regularly for networking. You wanna make sure you're incorporating those aspects because at the end of the day, networking didn't change. It's how you follow up and how you talk and present yourself initially. All right, and then, um... I know the pandemic has actually benefited your company in OA. Do you want to just briefly tell us what's happening with you as you grow more? Sure. So we added on, uh, we were talking about earlier about the virtual aspect. So we added um, the production aspect. So now we're able to utilize that IT degree uh, with event planning and uh, we're able to actually um, do the production aspect. So we produce a lot of events now. Um, on both the planning and the production side, which is really good because it means we actually know the beginnings, the end flow of everything. We have every aspect of the event under control. So, yep, it's great. All righty, fabulous. Yeah. All righty, well, thank you, Erin. So let's go ahead and move to our Q&A part. Uh, if we can go ahead and have Mary Ellen and Jared join us. Um, and if you have questions from the audience that you would like to submit, please use the Q&A. And we have had some pre-submitted questions. So let's just go ahead and start working through those while other people are asking some questions. Alrighty, so this question can go to whoever or all of you. Uh, when it comes to strategic sponsorship packages, what are some good benefits which can be offered for virtual or hybrid events? Let's see, Mary Ellen will take it first. <laughs> Yeah, for, for our audience, overwhelmingly what they're wanting is either one-on-one -on -one connections or exposure. Uh, and for us, we're lucky we have a wide variety of, of platforms. We we are primarily a print publication, but we're multimedia. We've got video, podcasts, uh, social media. So um, I, I think a lot of times people aren't maximizing their social media exposure uh, along with their event promotion. I think that's a, a a key that a lot of people don't utilize as much. And I think one thing that is probably going to live on through our live events is incorporating more video. Uh, I think a lot of sponsors went to video virtually, and I think we're going to see a whole lot more of that in our live events as a result. I, I would echo that. Um, you know, a lot of our sponsors, they do want that exposure at these live events. Um, and when we move to the virtual uh, for Purple Party, for example, um, we did incorporate that video aspect. And so while we, again, we're kind of producing an hour long TV show, uh, they produced a commercial that played 
uh, during that event. Um, so our presenting sponsor had, you know, a, a commercial to promote their business and say, you know, thanks for attending the Purple Party. Um, and, and so did some of our other high level sponsors. And, and uh, one of the things that we still look for um, with our sponsorships as we're soliciting those is um, at the end of the day, it's, it's mission driven. And so finding those sponsors that believe in what we're doing, believe in the mission of our cause, um, they, they'll get on board. And, and so I would encourage you, uh, if you're, you're hitting a bump in the road trying to find those sponsors, keep looking, uh, because you will find those people that, that they believe in what you're doing, whether it's on Zoom or not. And so they'll, they'll come out and support you. How about you, Aaron? Do you have anything more to add to that? Not, I'm, nothing more. I mean, nope. I'm going to let y'all have it. That's great. <laughs> it's tough when you're the last one because it it's is. like what she said and a little bit of what he said. <laughs> right. All righty. So um, our next pre-submitted question, what type of events may be more effective in a virtual setting even when in-person is an option? I think, Mary Ellen, let's start with you on that one. Uh, yeah, none. Uh, I know Erin disagrees wholeheartedly with me on this one. She, because there are, it's just not for our world. I do see for conferences that are national or international, I see a ton of opportunity. That's just not our world. We, we, we have a 50 mile coverage area and people are hungry to get back together. Uh, we, we held our first fully live event last August. Uh, we leased a baseball park and on a reason their bubble had an entire section to themselves. So we're looking to get creative that way uh, because for us, that networking is key. So um, not, to, not to diss on virtual events, I've loved my experience. I've loved everything I've learned, but I hope I get to throw that playbook away soon. <laughs> I'll say that one of the things that we found is kind of a su surprise success was our volunteer orientations, um, where people that are interested in volunteering with us, uh, there's a monthly orientation that we would host in our boardroom. Those went virtual and actually had some higher attendance than when we were in person. And so people that were sitting at home looking for things to do uh, to occupy their time as soon as they could do that, um, they were able to tune in and learn about all the great volunteer opportunities with our organization uh, and learn a little bit more about our mission too. So that was one that I think will uh, definitely continue for us as a virtual option. Okay, so it's not that I, I, I love in person and I love virtual as well. So one of the things I love about it is for virtual events, so we have lots of clients, right? So for our nonprofit clients, they are able to reach out to people who have maybe retired and moved to other places and still keep them connected to the mission. So that's why I like that aspect. Um, and so as for as Missouri State, like we have made had amazing events where we have people from all over. Now we're all connected again. So that's a great aspect. But but believe me, like when homecoming comes around in October, I am going to be one of the first ones there. Uh, I have an event on Thursday night, but I will be there Thursday night, like to be prepared to have a great time because I haven't seen people in two years. So I really want to see people um, back, you know, in person. So I'm all about both of them. But, you know, like weddings, I really need them to come back to, to have be together. Like I, the virtual live streaming weddings. I mean, that's not even I, it's OK for certain people, but you can't have a great time. You only get to do the ceremony because we're not going to. Who wants to live stream the reception? No one. And so, you know, those are types of things that I'm thinking about. So I agree. I like them both. <laughs> it's hard to eat the cake when you aren't there, right? <laughs> right. We don't want to hurt their feelings with all this good food and stuff that you don't get to do. Watch them eat the cake. And what? <laughs> all righty. Um, how do you manage expectations of event attendees? who have attended a long-standing in-person event several times. How do you kind of make up for the fact that they cannot interact with fellow attendees in person like they're used to? Is that me? Is that mine? Is that yours, Jared? I think it's for whoever. Erin, you unmuted first. So that means oh. you. we're going to go with you first. All right, fine. That's work. So it's all about communication, right? Communication and expectations. Um, we we communicate with our guests as much as possible right now to let them know what they're going to experience. What um, because we're planning that along the way, 
we want to make sure they understand this is what you're going to experience. This is, this is the plan. This is what you're going to experience. And so, you know, one of the things we did, um, we have, um, um, some of our events have like host committees. And so if we have a virtual event and we have a host committee, we have, we make their event, their like first meeting, kickoff meeting, it's virtual. And so we make sure that experience is very similar to the experience that they're going to have uh, for the, for the event or gala or whatever that's going to be. So we try to, so once we plant that seed with the host committee or sponsors or whatever, however we're gathering initially, uh, that kind of just trickles down. So they know, oh, so one time we sent um, uh, our invitations out this for um, a gala, but we sent them out virtually. So it was a video and we were like, welcome to this event. You know, you'll see my face on there, which I don't like to be on video, uh, but I introduced them and let them know what they were going to experience, but they saw me on video um, just letting them know what they were going to experience. So it just really depends on how you do it. Um, but I think the communication is going to be the key. I think, you know, the communication along the way was very important um, as we were going through. So we, we did a lot of that via email with everybody that was registering uh, and on Facebook and, and social media that was, here's what to expect, you know, what's going to be different, what's going to be the same, and really setting them up with, you know, tools to have a successful Purple House party, uh, if they were doing that, uh, even down to in, you know, this year, our, our theme was centered around 80s television. So we printed a TV guide uh, that had all the information about what they're going to see tonight, even down to instructions on how to uh, get it on your TV. So you're not just staring at your computer or your phone all night. So, you know, a step by step of uh, how to make this engaging for your participants that are there with your party um, and, and what to expect, uh, you know, from everybody, you know, our board of directors down to uh, the attendees. This was uh, a communication from start to finish on what to expect. Well, I don't, I don't really have a whole lot to add to what they're saying. Uh, a challenge that, that we had with having so many events and no two looked alike, uh, that communication and letting them know where, you know, where they're going to be on, on YouTube, on a private YouTube channel. Was it going to be on Facebook Live? Was it going to be through Zoom? You know, being just telling them and you know, our average age of audience is 55. So that means some are older. So there's just a line of demarcation of comfort with uh, technology. And so being explicit in how to get those things uh, and particularly for our panelists, that's where we had to spend a lot of time educating because being a panelist is a very different experience than being an attendee and understanding um, when you can be seen, when you can't be seen, how you're going to access it, separate links, all of that. Um, so yeah, communication, communication, communication. There you go. Okay, uh, we had a question from the audience come in. Jared, this one looks like it's for you. Uh, for a nonprofit organization with an important purpose such as Harmony House, do you foresee virtual options allowing you to extend your reach? I'd imagine there are people who would want to contribute or be involved, but can't attend the live fundraisers. Uh, that's a great question. And we actually both uh, times that we've done the virtual purple party, we've had some folks tune in uh, from out of state uh, that uh, follow our, our progress on social media. They've been uh, either, I think both of the attendees this year, I know, uh, had been Springfield residents or had been Missouri residents that had supported Harmony House um, in, in one way or another um, and saw the event and they, they purchased a ticket to attend and they viewed from, uh, I think, as far away as Arizona and, and uh, Hawaii this year. So uh, our message was getting out there and, and they were you know supporting a great cause, but uh, that does bring up a good point that it did allow us um, to extend our reach um, especially with the online auction, a lot of the items that we included on there uh, were some um, experiences, some travel experiences. So really anybody could bid on those. A lot of them were local items here, but um, there were some that, you know, they're, they're digital, you know, we can send them a gift certificate that we got from a local vendor here and, or a national vendor. Um, so it was easy to, you know, take care of the shipping on a few of those things. So it did extend that out and, and uh, really, um, also, you know, extend our donor base and our supporter base that way too. Great. Um, 
So what are some of some good giveaways that you can give to potential clients uh, prior to a fun virtual meeting? I know Jared, you sent out, you sent things in advance like food and pet. Tell me what each of you have kind of done that was maybe a really good idea. Well, this year we added to the party packs uh, some ingredients for a signature drink and had a local uh, bartender uh, help us with a special video. He was a sponsor. And, and so part of that, again, with the commercial aspect, he got to be uh, the guy at the start of the party. You tune in and, and he was going to show you how to how to make your drink. Uh, and then the gift that came along with that was uh, a purple uh, wine tumbler uh, that you could enjoy your drink in with with everybody while you were uh, participating. Um, for us, we didn't do anything for SBJ events, but the other side of, of my life, High Tide Communications, one of our clients, uh, it was a nonprofit, and the, it's a very, very expensive gala, uh, thousands of dollars per table, and they're used to a five-course meal, unending wine, and so um, engaged a caterer to do kind of like a Hello Fresh box, and it was a better meal than they've ever gotten at the event live with full instructions on how to cook it, when to cook it, when to start, what, when. And it was just amazing, amazing. And we could see all of the, the house parties going on. And uh, it, was, it was also a little voyeuristic getting to see into all of these uh, homes too. <laughs> so it was fun. Yep. So I agree with um, Mary Ellen. We definitely send out food. So we work with our caterers. Um, we send out food. We send out lots of wine, like lots of wine. Um, so that was, that, that's been a key to our success. Um, and also, you know, whatever swag that, that, that they're doing. So a lot of our um, people during COVID decided to do a little rebranding and so we send out rebranding opportunities during that time frame as well, especially to sponsors. Um, and then what we like to do is follow up. Um, we'll, you know how everyone has a program book. Uh, we actually, we do our virtual program book for everyone, but then our sponsors will send them out a physical copy with their thank you letter, with a personal um, handwritten thank you note. Um, so just to keep that connection there. Well, thank you all for being here with us today. I know we didn't get to all of the questions, but um, look for an email from me this week because the panelists have graciously agreed to offer their emails. And so that will give you an opportunity to follow up with them if your question wasn't answered or if you think of something else. Um, but please watch for that. Also, we'll be sending the recorded link of this session and a survey link for your feedback. And if you have suggestions for future Bear Talks topics, uh, that is going to be one of the virtual activities that we keep. And that's going to be our monthly Bear Talks. We've had a great success with that. It's been wonderful connecting with our alums from all over. Um, and so we love that. So those will continue, but we'd love to hear your ideas as far as topics that you would like to see, or maybe you know some Missouri State alums and that could even be yourself if uh, you would like to uh, put those on the survey and share who might be a good panelist for us, we'd love that. So our next Bear Talks webinar will be Tuesday, May 4th from noon to 1 p.m. Central Time. And the topic is career and personality assessments. So thank you all again for being here and to our panelists, we so appreciate it. And everyone have a great afternoon and we're gonna say bye-bye. <laughs> Have a good one. Thank you.